when I read about the people that just don't feel love and feel support and feel their government or their education system or their parents or whatever it is, the message of the church needs to be one of love. That no matter what, God loves them. No matter what, God loves them. God loves the sinner. God loves... Well, let's think about it, folks. We were once sinners. It's interesting to uh, watch all the debate going on about this problem and that problem and this group and that group. And, you know, know, I'm not going to throw out names this morning (laughs) of groups. Too many people in the church going around judging people because they're of this group or they're of this persuasion or whatever. God said he loves all sinners. And he said he died for them. If he's willing to die for them, then they're included in the package that when they walk in our door that they would be made welcome. Because God wants to bless them. And he wants to change them like he's changing us. Changing us from glory to glory. And some of us need to be changed, don't we? Lee tells me daily. Well, I guess I better not go there. (laughs) Uh, Can you turn to John chapter 7? I'll be good with Jack this morning because he's going on holiday soon. So we'll 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 take it easy on Jack. John chapter 7. I'm going to read the verse I read a couple of weeks ago. And then we're going to go into Isaiah very much still have on my heart what God is uh, wanting to do, and a lot of it's con- to do with pouring out His rivers of living water. Amen. Amen. Rivers of living water. John chapter 7, verse 37 to 39. Most of you are there. John chapter 7, verse 37. And on the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, Is anyone thirsts? Let him come to me and drink. And he who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this Jesus spoke concerning the Holy Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit had not yet been given, because Jesus had not yet been glorified. Jesus is asking the world, and he's saying to the people at the feast, and this is the Feast of Tabernacles, on that great day, the last day of the feast, he stands and says, Is anyone thirsty? Because he's been watching people go to church all week and coming out the same. He's been watching people go to church all his life, coming out unchanged. And a couple questions I would have if I could ask them. Is the world in need of water or spiritual refreshing? Are the poor worse off? Is there needy people that need assistance and or change and or help in their lives in this world? And we would all go, yes. But here's a question. Is the church dry and thirsty? Most of us don't want to answer that question. Because we are the church. And we're saying the church is dry and thirsty. Then we're admitting that in front of a mirror, we're saying to the God that we have some problems and some things in our lives that need to change. We can't spare to shy away from some of those things. I was watching uh, Beth Moore this week. And she used a phrase which I really like. She says, the church is not sharing their faith because they have too little left to give away. And I thought, whoa. There. <laughs> she said, church, why aren't we sharing our faith? Is it because some of you have so little to give away? That is one you will have to answer in front of the mirror and in front of the Holy Spirit in your prayer closet. But it sure made me, uh, made me think a little bit. Is anyone thirsty? Let him come to the living waters, which is the Holy Spirit. We speak words of life. We, speak, we can speak testimonies of what God has done in our life. And they have life in them. And they are a river of the Holy Spirit. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 41. 
So that's really where I want to go this morning. Isaiah 41. Isaiah 41, verse 17 to 20. Before we go there, I had a word that the Lord gave me on Friday night, and I still believe I'm supposed to share it this morning. And I just want to uh, share it with you this morning. I was I was praying about the rain this week and the fact that we have had rain that we have never had in southwestern Ontario in decades. I don't remember the last time the Weather Network had to give out a rainfall warning. And as I was in here praying on Thursday and Friday, and just sort of like you know, God, what's because I believe very much the natural and the spiritual are tied in. And Friday night, the, word, the Lord gave me a word, and it was that even as he's been pouring out in the natural, he's about to pour out in the spiritual. But in that pouring out, it is a time of cleansing because the water is used for cleansing. In the Old, ta- in the Old Testament, the tabernacle, the first thing they did when they stepped in the gate was to go to the bronze labor and to wash because the people had to prepare themselves. And we are called priests, and the priests could not step into the Holy of Holies without washing themselves and doing it in a, in a precise way. And I believe the Lord is calling the church to a time of washing and cleansing themselves and making themselves holy and fit for service again. Because the church has gotten so muddied and influenced by the world that we are unfit to stand in front of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That while he is a God of mercy, we cannot fulfill our priestly roles. But he wants to pour out and wash us and cleanse us. I just believe it's a time for the church to get real. To get serious. Because God wants to move. He so desperately is waiting to move. He wants revival more than what we do. And yet the church needs to stand and get washed and cleansed. It's time to lay down some of those things and lay down those things that are comfortable to us. It's amazing. I was, I was watching some people the other day discuss this thing on, and they were talking about certain shows that are on in 2014 would not have been allowed on the airways 2009. And what was allowed on in 2009 wouldn't have been allowed on in 2000. And what was allowed on 2000 definitely would have been allowed, wouldn't have been on TV in 1984. But our our standards are going this way. We keep thinking we're going this way, but our standards, if we're paying attention, are not going God's way. God's way is always higher. Let's read Isaiah 41. The poor and needy seek water, but there is none. Their tongues fail for thirst, or there are parts, some translations have. But I love this next part. I, the Lord, will hear them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. If any of you feel forsaken this morning, the word of the Lord is, He will not forsake them. I will open rivers in barren or desolate places, heights, depending on what your translation says. And fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool. Isn't that interesting? It's going to transform the wilderness into a pool of water. In the dry land, springs of water. I will plant. The Lord says, I'm going to plant in the wilderness the cedar tree, the acre tree, the myrtle tree, the oil tree, or the olive tree. I will set... In the desert, the cypress tree and the pine and the box tree together, that they may see and know. I'm going to add in here. That they may consider and understand together all that I'm doing. This point, that the hand of the Lord has done this. And that the Holy One of Israel has created this. What has He created? Out of ashes, He has created beauty. Out of barrenness, he's created a, fort, a, a forest. Out of once what was dead and barren has now come to life. Where there was no water, he has created a pool of water because the rivers are flowing. 
When the poor and needy seek water and there is none, and their tongues are parched for thirst, I, the Lord, will hear them, and I, the Lord, will not forsake them. It is a message to Israel at this time. It is also a message to God's people in our time that he is with us. That even in our barren times, even in our dry times, even in those times when we feel like God has left us and we're dry. Anybody ever been dry before as a Christian? Five of us. The rest of you may need to come to confession afterward. But I, the Lord, will not forsake them. Folks, let's be honest. We all go through dry times. We are human beings. There are good times. There are bad times. It says in his word that there are high points, there are mountains, and then there are valleys in our lives. But the good news is he will not forsake us. The good news is he says he walks with us. The good news is he says he, he talks with us. The good news is he says, I go before you when you step into that valley of the shadow of death. He is always with us. And not only is he with us, he's in front of us. Not only is he in front of us, he's behind us. Because he is our rear guard. He's our protector. And he's the one who will walk with us. These sections, these 8 to 10, 12, whatever it is, chapters in Isaiah, starting in chapter 40, are called the chapters or the um, areas of comfort. They're comfort to the church. I love 40, 41, 42. Some of these chapters are just wonderful. But they are called the prophecies of comfort, prophecies to the church, prophecies to his followers. And it is a message that he is with us. It is a message he has not forsaken us. It is a message that he will answer even in the dry times. Take a look again at chapter 17. I've got this in, in almost all my Bibles, underlined and circled and highlighted, and I had trouble reading the one. The poor seek water, the poor and needy, but there is none. And their waters fail for thirst. I want you to understand, man's ways don't last. What he's saying is here is man's supplies have run out and man's resources have run out. Now there's nothing left but for God to show up. There is no hope but God. You know my favorite phrase, but God. God can change everything in a moment, but God. People are dying all over the world. But God will send a revival. There are people dying of cancer, but God will send healing. There are people who are in financial trouble, but God will make a way. But God makes a difference for the entire world and for you. And then he says, I, the Lord, he identifies himself. And then he clarifies, I, the God of Israel, I will open rivers. I will make the wilderness a pool. I will set in the desert. Isn't that interesting? How many of you know people who go and put plants in the desert? Tammy, I know you have a bit of a garden. I doubt you go and put plants, you know, in the gar- in, a, in a desert. Most normal people aren't going to the desert and planting. Do you know that right now there's a desert in, uh, in Israel, and I forget the name of it or where it is because I'm not that good on Israel landscape. But they have transformed it. Out of, a, out of a desert place into a place that flows with trees and fruit trees. And, and it's just, they've transformed the land. That's what God can do for us. See, what answers do you have for the poor in need? They're seeking life. They're seeking refreshing. They're seeking water. They're seeking for something to satisfy their need for life. Something that will satisfy their thirst. Because folks, They're dying. They're dying. Something real, something tangible. Man, the whole world is looking for something real and tangible. They're trying the occult. They're trying mysticism. They're trying everything to try and find out what is real and what is tangible. But there is none. Their tongues fail. They are parched. They're sticking to the roof of their mouth. How many of you ever played sports on a real hot day or worked and your, your, your tongue, you know, gets parched? You can hardly talk. You have no power when you're speaking. There's no emphasis It feels like to them that they're about to die. But God. But God. I, the Lord, I will hear them. I, the Lord, God of Israel. I hear them when their mouth is dry. I hear them when they can barely just whisper, God, I'm dying. God, I'm dying. But God hears them. He says, I will hear them in their parched state. 
And I will hear their whisper and I will hear their cry for help. More importantly, he says, I will not forsake them. I love that part. Last part of not forsake them. You can turn to the person next to you, whoever it is, and say, God will not forsake you. God is always watching out for you and he will keep you. Our walk on this earth, our walk is sometimes like a wilderness, isn't it? Life sometimes, let's just use the word, it sucks. Words, work sometimes is hard. There are tough circumstances. It sometimes feel like there is a desert and I'm dying of thirst. But why would he plant trees? He specifically plants trees. And I want you to note he planted seven trees. Seven is an unusual number. You're planting trees. You plant two apple trees, two cedar trees, two, you know, because we do things two by two. We're like Noah, two by two. He picks seven individual trees. He's planting trees because when you're in the desert, there's nothing like a good shelter. Jonah, when he was dying and he was upset at God, he said, you call me to preach to these people. And it's the heat of the day. And then he found relief in a bush. When you are in the desert, you need protection from the sun, from the elements, and you need water. And God says, I'm going to give you water, and plus I'm going to plant these trees. I want you to read with me a little bit about verse 18. And I want you just to think a little bit about what the Lord is saying. And my question again, I have another question, is do you know what revival is? Revival is this, I will open rivers in barren places. I will cause fountains in the midst of valleys. See, revival is when there is no move of God, when there is dry, the land is dying, the people are dying for lack of knowledge, the people have no knowledge of Jesus Christ, and God shows up in a powerful way, and people start to get saved, people start to get healed. That's what revival is, because the presence of God has been poured out on the nations. Like a river. And I will make the wilderness a pool. And I will cause the dry land springs of water. And then out of that he is going to plant. Because God always wants to establish his people. He always wants to establish his ways. God is a God who transforms the hard places. The difficult situations. God is one who changes your situation and your life around. Verse 18, God is opening up the river of heaven. His river is going to a desolate place. And fountains spring up. And I want to spring off that. Out of, out of nowhere comes this fountain. Suddenly. Jason spoke on that about one or two weeks ago. Suddenly, there's a change. Suddenly, where there's dryness, there's a fountain. Suddenly, where there's death, all of a sudden... Life starts to come. Most of you have watched Lion King because you've got kids or grandkids. And you remember the scene where the place has been burnt, there's nothing, and all of a sudden the rain starts to come. That is not a heavenly movie by any point, but it gets my point across because most of you watched it. But all of a sudden, out of the darkness, the rain starts to wash away, the smoke and ashes, and, and the grass starts to grow, and the bushes start to come back. That's what God can do to a burnt-out valley. That's what God can do for a burnt-out person. Someone in addiction and someone struggling in their life, God can pour out life to them. That's a good place for an amen. As God moves, revival comes. Transformation comes. Life comes. We need to break off some of the comfortable things. We are quite comfortable in church. Some churches are so comfortable, they have the hymns up on the wall. We're going to sing this, 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 and this. Some have certain prayers they sing, but God is not a God of comfort. God is a God who wants to move like a river. And He wants His presence. There are sometimes people, why do you sing that song five times? I don't know, we just felt God just kind of rested on it. There was something on that song. It's not about being comfortable. It's not about saying the same prayers or the same worship style. Sometimes you may sing all slow songs. Sometimes the next week you may sing all fast songs. Sometimes the week after that it may be a mixture. It doesn't matter. It's about doing what God wants you to do. When God's Holy Spirit moves, the wind of God, the wind of heaven begins to blow. 
Do you know that you can't put restrictions on wind? Our government's putting up all kinds of these ugly propellers all over the place. Drove to Sarney the other day. Man, there's about 100 of them now on the 402. What a lovely drive that is now. Anyway, get back to the word. God's Holy Spirit is wind and it is free to blow wherever it wants to blow. It cannot be corralled. It cannot be chained. Sometimes God is hard to hear. Have you ever found God hard to hear? Usually it's us. Usually there's a lot of distractions. See, God wants to connect to his people. He wants to speak, but we must have an ear to hear and to feel him and to sense him and let the wind blow on us, that refreshing. Verse 19, it says that he will plant in the wilderness the cedar tree and he will plant the acacia tree. And the myrtle and the olive or the oil tree, depending what your translation has in it's the same thing, the olive or the oil tree. And he will set in the desert the cypress and the pine and the box tree together. Why is he doing that? That they may see and know. Verse 20 is the real, verse 17 and 20. That they may see and know, that they may consider and understand together that God has done this. I got into some translations just to understand why he specifically named these trees. Most of you will remember some of this once I mention it. But just want to point it out that the cedar tree was known. Cedars of Lebanon. A tall, majestic tree. Good for building on. But it also was used in the tabernacle. That was one of the directions that God said, use the cedar tree to build such and such. It's known for its firmness of roots. Any of you have ever had to tear out a cedar bush? Remember one time at our first house, ripping it up, we finally just put a chain around the back of the car. I thought I was going to lose the back of the car. But we did, we did get her done. <laughs> the, the, the Achaia tree. It's a large tree. Its bark has large thorns on it. And these thorns extrude a gum every so often. And as the tree gets older, the bark becomes very hard and starts to look like ebony. And under God's direction, it also was used in the building of the tabernacle. So it's interesting that God is saying, I'm going to rebuild this wilderness. I'm going to rebuild this barrenness. And he specifically starts picking out these trees that were used in the building of the tabernacle. The myrtle tree is one that grows quickly and was often used for shelter. The olive tree, which... It's pretty obvious. The olive oil was used in the lanterns, was used by the priests in the lighting of the lamps. The fir tree or the cypress tree, it's known for being a noble tree. And again, it is listed as one of the trees used in the building of the tabernacle. The pine tree is a hard, a hardwood, a strong, enduring tree. Planting of the pine tree because they have a capacity to grow. I love this part. They can grow almost anywhere. When you see them through the Canadian Shield, it's often a pine tree that is up there. And the pine tree is a knack for growing in tough places, for getting its root down into cracks. And in fact, the longer it is there, the more it breaks apart the rocks and allows, as the rain comes, allows the topsoil to be carried away to bless and encourage other plants. But they will grow in the hard places, and their roots will cause the rocks to crack. Sometimes you may wonder, why am I here? Esther's going, why am I here? Why did God put me in this workplace? Because she is someone who's got roots down and is going to cause that rock to crack, that God can come in and do a work. The box tree, a tree that is smaller than other cedars, and it's known for its small cones, but it's also known for this fact. Its arms, its branches go upward. What a beautiful picture. That this one tree grows quickly. It's smaller, but its arms, its branches go upward. He specifically names these five trees. And often when we study scripture, we bypass some of these things. We bypass cities. We bypass names. But when the Lord is speaking, 
and writing things. We need to be paying attention. When he prophetically declares to his prophet, I want you to go and say these things, that in the hard times I'm going to cause the rivers to flow. In the hard times I'm going to let this happen. But I will come back and I will not forsake you. And I will let the river flow. And I will once again bring life. I will once again bring fruit. I will once again allow life and bushes and grass and everything to grow because people will come to life when I touch them. And here is proof because I'm going to speak specifically. He didn't say I'm going to put up an oak tree, a maple tree, and this tree and that tree. He picked these trees. Seven. Seven speaks of completes. Seven speaks of being restored or full. The work is complete. After he has planted these trees, the work is complete. Transformation is done. And why is it done? Because that they may see and know that the hand of the Lord has done this. That the Holy One of Israel has touched this land. That the hand of God has done the work and transformed that life, transformed that family, transformed that church, transformed that city. Because only God can do it. So it happens for this reason, that he gets the glory when the work is done. Daphne can tell people at work, how are you doing that? It's not me, it's the God in me. He gets the glory. How are you healed? Well, the doctors worked on me, but actually it wasn't them. It was the God who healed me. Right, Melis? When our families are going through situations, how did you handle that? I was a mess, but the God in me gave me strength. As I close this morning, is there anyone here this morning who needs relief from the tough journey of life? Is there anyone here this morning that you're in bondage or you feel you're in captivity? Maybe you've made some poor choices. How many of you have made poor choices? Well, there's a few more of us now. Sometimes addictions get a hold of us. Sometimes choices in life. But I want to remind you this morning that God will flow like a river into your desperate and desolate situation and bring change. That God is here to help you and break addictions off you. He is here to help you. We can't change the past, but He can give you a new future. He is here to put water into your dry wilderness He is here to put life into your dead situation. And those of us who feel so dry and so burnt up, He is about to pour back in you a pool that will allow the living water to flow in you. See, God comes to transform your life. Jesus came to this earth for one reason, one reason only, that we might be saved All you have to do is believe. That's all we have to do. It's a simple message, but often people miss it because all we have to do is believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that He died for us and rose again. That's all we have to believe. And He turned to the guy who was hanging on the cross to Him and said, Today, because you believe, you will be with me in paradise. What a wonderful transformation for that man. Hanging on a cross, convicted criminal, ridiculed in front of people, on his deathbed, as it were, and turns and says, leave him alone. I believe he is who he said he was. And Jesus turns to him and says, come on up with me to heaven. Come on up. All because he can transform a life. Let's bow our heads. Enola, can you put something on? Nothing but the blood, maybe. Father, we just bow our heads and... uh, Lord, I just ask if there's anybody here this morning that has not made that personal decision to accept Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, that they would just come and we would pray with them at the front, Father, that they would make that decision of moving from desert into life that they would make that decision to move out of having no vegetation, no being lost, 
but Father, that you've come to find them. You've been searching all over for them, and you've been searching in the barren places, the desert places, the wilderness, but your desire is that they would become saved and come to know you. And Father, for some that are here this, t- this morning, they're feeling dry, they're feeling, feeling weary. I ask that you would just come and pour in your water. I pray that you would come and move on them like the breath of heaven. I pray that you would put a tree around them to protect them from the onslaught of the world. I pray that you would allow the pools to be placed in front of them, that they could dive in and be refreshed. I pray, Father, for a move of the Spirit in our our city. I pray for a move of the Spirit in our church. I pray for our nation that revival would come. And that, Father, that it would start with us. I pray that you would open our hearts and ears to hear what the Spirit is saying. I pray that you would open our our mindset, Father, to the changes you want to make in us. To break off what is comfortable, but to move into what you want us to do. Lord, I believe you're calling the church to a cleansing time. A time of preparation. I believe you want to move. You're waiting to move. It's to the church. So, Father, as as we spoke this, this morning... Wash us and refresh us. Take us from that thing of the past to new beginnings. You're a new God of new beginnings. You're God of new creation. You are the God as we learned about in our Sunday school. By you, all things were created. And so, Father, if there is someone here today that does not know you, they knew can today can know that you are going to touch them and make them a new creation in Jesus Christ. We ask all these things in your name. Father, give us traveling mercies as we go. For those who need just to come and just spend time with you, Father, just meet them. For those who may want to just fast a little bit today or pray a little bit today, Father, I pray that you would just put it in people's hearts to draw closer to you, to draw closer to you, to draw closer to you. Because you're desiring your people to draw nigh to you. Ask us in your name. Amen. The altar is open. If you want to just come and pray, you're welcome to pray. If you do not know Jesus Christ, if that spoke to you, I would love to pray with you. I'd like you to come on down and we'll pray with you. We'll just make sure you're confident of your relationship with Jesus Christ. And folks, I believe that was a prophetic word for the church. I believe that God is getting ready to move and I believe he is looking for his church to be cleansed and to be holy. Take it seriously. Consider it. Pray on it. I think some of us are being called to fast over the next week or so just to draw closer. So please just give us some consideration. Go home and read Isaiah 40, 41, 42, 45. Read some of those chapters in Isaiah. Let it get into your spirit a little bit. And be blessed. Have a great day.